just uh, to reintroduce the Reverend Dr. Jerry McDermott. The Reverend part is because he is an Anglican priest, as well as Professor of Divinity at the BC Divinity School in Birmingham, Alabama. He is um, author of many articles, books, books that are forthcoming, and though he is a Jonathan Edwards scholar, increasingly we see your energy flowing to this dynamic of what does it mean for Christians to recover Hebraic heritage? What does it mean for Christians to understand Israel and how to be supportive and why Christians should be supportive? So we've been very blessed uh, for the teaching that Jerry McDermott has brought. And once more, let's give a warm welcome to Jerry McDermott. I'm, I'm so glad some Jewish you know, brothers and sisters are here tonight. And it's not directly meant for you, and some of it you won't be able to go along with, and that's okay, and we understand that. Uh, the the uh, you know, Jewish and Christian religions started out in the same place. They've come out in different places, and so, you know, there still are differences. But, but I trust that you will be, that you will, you know, those of you who are Jewish will nevertheless um, that you will appreciate the Jewishness of the connections that I think we ought to be able to make as Christians here. So, what would all this mean as Christians? Six proposals. Number one, Israel shows us who we are and who God is. God called Israel to represent all the peoples of the world. She shows us who we are before God, both at our best and at our, and at our worst. So Israel illustrates God's creation of human beings with a capacity to trust in Him and the human tendency to reject God. The New Testament hints, paradoxically, that Israel was chosen to reject Jesus' messianic claim. But it also implies that this turn represents all human response to God. If Israel rejected Jesus, so did we. As the Lutheran Lenten hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus, asks, Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Uh, alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee. I crucified thee. Even in Israel's role in, in the death of Jesus means that for Christians, God used Israel to redeem the world, to bring insight to the world. We can say that Israel was elected to bear the glory and the pain of bringing salvation to the world. Therefore, we need to acknowledge that the world owes Israel a debt. This is true in the secular realm. For most of the last century's great scientific advances were gained by Jews. But it's also true religiously. As Jesus told the Samaritan woman, salvation is from the Jews. This means that we need Israel to know God. Israel shows us that we live by grace, just as she has survived millennia of persecution, including pogroms and the Holocaust only by the grace of God. So Israel shows us something about God and something about us. She also shows us something of the future. Paul asks, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Both Isaiah and Jesus suggest that on the renewed earth, Jews will lead the world in being priests of the king. Think of the intensity with which Orthodox Jews study the Bible and pray. How much more will they know and love God when, when the Messiah is fully revealed? Number two, sacred, his, um, sacred history is not over. 
Therefore, we can trust that God is still lovingly confronting the nations through Israel, and that Israel is still God's servant for the redemption of the world in some mysterious way. The biblical promises are not fulfilled completely yet. We still don't see the final and fullest redemption of Israel. Yet Israel, yet the state of Israel shows that the promises are being fulfilled. And as was said this afternoon, the state of Israel is the first fruit of the final redemption of the world. The restoration of Israel is a sign of the restoration of all the nations to come. So Israel continues to be a vessel of revelation. Her deliverance from the Holocaust and her restoration in the land reveal God's faithfulness to his covenantal promises. Her survival demonstrates to all with eyes to see that God is the Lord of history. Lutheran theologian Wolfhard Kronenberg wrote that the church is a sign of the end time, but not the end itself. I would add that Israel today is a sign of the end time because its restoration as a thriving people in the ancient land is the first fruit of the restoration of all the nations that Revelation chapter 22 talks about in the new earth to come. Prophetic fulfillment has not come to an end. Third, prophetic fulfillment is both revealed and hidden. You know, some of my supersessionist um, Christian friends and colleagues say, how can Israel be a God thing? How can you say, Jerry, that the modern state of Israel was brought about by God? Look at all the problems in Israel. Look at all the imperfections in Israel. And I say, well, that's interesting you should say that. Uh, you're a member of a church. Look at the worldwide Christian church. Are there any problems there? <laughs> Is it not radically sin-filled, full of very defective and sinful uh, people who sometimes do horrible things? Look at the history of the church, how it's persecuted, murdered Jews. And yet, you say the church is the body of Christ. You say the church is a God thing, even though the church has done many demonic and hateful and hellish things. If we can hold in tension the fact that the church is a God thing, as well as being full of problems, then certainly we ought to be able to hold in tension that modern Israel is a God thing with its imperfections. So why Israel? Why did God choose Israel? That's a mystery, the Bible says. Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, says in Romans 9 that God's judgments are inscrutable. Like his, his choosing you and his choosing me. Why did God choose you to have your role in the history of redemption? Jews and Christians. We can't answer that question. Neither can we answer the question of why God chose Israel and not Uganda. And how's it all going to work out? The, the, the future of the history of the work of redemption of the world. That too, the Bible makes clear, is a mystery. That despite the presumptions of some Christians that they know how it's all going to end. We cannot... I would argue the Bible makes it clear we cannot know with any precision how and when it's all going to end. The same applies to these present stages of fulfillment for latter-day Israel. That the emergence of modern Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy seems plain. But how all this is working out and how it will work out is a mystery we must not think that we can penetrate with any precision. Fourth, the fulfillment is not in its final stage. We 
cannot know the, un the unfolding of the end times with any precision, but we can know that this stage of fulfillment is not the final one. I talked today about Ezekiel 37, the, the, uh, uh, the, the prophecy of the dry bones. It's significant, I think, that in this classic prophecy, the resurrection of Israel proceeds in stages. First, the bones come together, bone to bone. Then, God puts sinews and flesh and skin on the dry bones. Then, he told Ezekiel to prophesy to these dry bones. Finally, the breath comes into the bones that now have flesh on them. They come to life and they stand up. In another version of the process, the, the, the Bible tells us that Ezekiel said that God would open their graves, bring them up from their graves, and then they would live. After that, he would place them on their own soil. Either at that point or after it, it's not clear in the Hebrew to me, they would know that I, the Lord, it says, have spoken and will act. So besides showing that spiritual renewal seems to come after return to the land, this classic account of Israel's return suggests that the restoration of Israel to the land takes place in stages. Now speaking of spiritual renewal, you know, many Christians, and this used to be my position, have said that modern Israel is only a partial fulfillment of, biblical, of the biblical prophecies because Jeremiah and Ezekiel both talk about spiritual restoration as well as temporal restoration that comes to Israel. And I, I, I was giving an academic paper at an academic conference for Christians and Jews in Chicago a couple years ago, and I made this point that evangelicals aren't sure this is the complete fulfillment because they don't see the spiritual renewal in Israel. So this young um, Jewish scholar from Philadelphia raised his hand, and I already knew him, he knew me, and he says, Jerry, why do you say that? How do you know that spiritual renewal is not going on in Israel? And I said, and I knew he had lived in Israel, I, I said, well, you tell me. And basically he said, Spiritual renewal is going on in Israel, but it's under the radar. And Christians are not going to see it, and the rest of the world is not going to see it. All over Israel, from top to bottom, he says, I know people, from the top to bottom of society, who are coming back to the God of Israel in their own way. They might not be going to synagogue on a weekly basis, but they're, they're coming back to faith in the God of Israel. Spiritual renewal is going on in Israel. Now, it's not apparent, um, sorry, now only a part of, of the Jewish people has gathered together into a Jewish state, and only in certain areas of the country. Only some of the returnees observe the precepts of Torah. Um, political and military strife have not vanished from the land. Peace is elusive. And morality is sometimes compromised, like in every other country of the world, like in the church. Universal redemption seems sometimes more, more remote than before. In short, the concrete fulfillment brought by Zionism remains partial and shaky, stopping well short of the fullness sketched by the biblical prophecies, even if there is spiritual renewal going on. As the rabbis said, the end of days continues to tarry. I, I would hasten to add two things, however. First, there's always tension between promise and fulfillment of any prophecy. And we need to live with that tension. As I just said, we already live with that tension in the church, believing that somehow mysteriously and not at all evidently, the church is the body of Christ, in spite of its many, many profound spots and wrinkles and blemishes. Second, the final coming that we await is not a perfect Israeli people or a perfect Israeli state, but that of the Son of Man of Daniel 7. Number five is that Israel and the church are integrally joined. 
we have much to learn from each other. We in the church need to learn from the rabbinic tradition. Thousands of years, men and women of God have given their whole lives to study of Torah. God's word, God's original word, God's first word. And most of us Christian theologians don't pay any attention to the Talmud or the Mishnah. We have so much to learn from the rabbinic tradition. Not just the Bible, but the rabbinic tradition. But also, if Jews are in communion with the God of Israel, who is the only true God, and I believe Jews are, you know, religious Jews, those who love the God of Israel, are in communion with the God of Israel, they're in communion now I, you know, this is for Christians. I know, you know, you know, some of my new Jewish friends are not going to follow me on this. But that means that if they're in communion with the true God, the, the, the God of Israel, they're in communion with the God we believe is the Father of Jesus Christ. And therefore, in some mysterious way, we are in communion with them. Now, I've already suggested that the Bible teaches it. That, that the Bible teaches without often putting it precisely like this. But nevertheless, that God took Jewish flesh up into his inner life when he raised Jesus' body to his right hand. And that body of Jesus is still a Jewish body. This is part of the mystery of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. Here, Christians participate in the covenant that God made with Jewish flesh, communing with the Jewish body and blood of the Messiah. Now, this is difficult for some Christians to swallow, but no more difficult than it was for Jesus' disciples, many of whom turned back and no longer walked with him after he told them that they must eat the flesh of the Son of Man drink his blood. This is what John said was a hard saying. But this is another example of the scandal of particularity. The problem for many that Christianity is about particular people and lands rather than every person in every place universally. It's impossible for many to accept that God saved the world through a particular Jewish man in a particular <coughs> Jewish land. Although the objection has been around for millennia, the 18th century deists first raised this protest in the modern world by complaining that, God, that a God for the whole world would never restrict his revelation to certain peoples in certain times, nor would he have chosen just one people in an isolated part of the world. All, rev all true revelation, they said, from the true God would be universal. And any revelation that was restricted to a particular people in a particular land cannot also be universal. Therefore, it cannot be true. I would suggest that the scandal of Zionism is the 21st century version of the scandal of particularity. Just as he did thousands of years ago, God still comes to the world through a particular people in a particular land. That people are still important to him. That land is now the place where prophecy is being fulfilled. And that people's king will one day rule visibly from that same land. Number six, the history of Jews, the history of the Jews shows us the mystery of iniquity. One of the most inscrutable passages in the Bible is Paul's reference in 2 Thess Thessalonians 2 to the, what he calls the mystery of iniquity in his cryptic discussion of the future man of lawlessness. Now this is not the place we don't have the time to unpack Paul's vision of end times. But it's worth noting, at the end of this conference on Israel, 
that Israel gives us a window on the mystery of iniquity. Now, iniquity is sin, and sin is irrational. Just as there was no rational reason for Adam to eat the forbidden fruit, after all that he'd been given, and all that God had commanded, so too, we have no good reason to sin against a loving God who has given us all things. There's no better window on the irrationality of evil, even the banality of evil, as Hannah Arendt called it, than the recurring and ferocious hatred of Jews all through history. From the Persian Haman and the Greek Antiochus Epiphanes to Rome's brutal suppression of Jews after the first two Jewish revolts in A.D. 66 and 135, the ancient world ebbed and flowed with hatred of Jews and the blood of Jews. In the Middle Ages, Christians were responsible for blood libels, expulsions, forced conversions, and killings of Jews. In the modern era, the deists helped inaugurate a new era of anti-Semitism. Voltaire, I, I trust many of you don't know this, Voltaire, supposedly the great philosopher, supposedly the great prophet of tolerance, wrote that a Jew is someone who should have inscribed on his forehead, fit to be hanged. <clears throat> Modern anti-Semitism culminated in the Holocaust. And by the way, Voltaire and the Diaz were huge influences on Kant and Schleimach, <coughs> both incredibly anti-Semitic. Modern anti-Semitism culminated in the Holocaust, during which the Nazis exterminated six million Jews, two-thirds of the Jewish population of Europe. I read that before the Holocaust, there were 16 million Jews in the world, and today there's only 15. Jews have gone down in number since before the Holocaust. But thank God, the birth rate in Israel is one of the highest in the world. <laughs> the birth rate of Jews in Israel. Now, Daniel Goldenhagen, the historian, showed about 15 years ago that it was not just the Nazis who killed Jews, but sometimes ordinary citizens, not just of Germany, but of Europe, volunteered to do the same. Volunteered to go help. Now today, anti-Semitism is on the rise with the BDS movement in universities threatening boycotts, divestments, and sanctions with respect to Israel. And Jews openly attacked and killed in Europe today. Their crime, when all is said and done, is because they're Jews. There's no way to explain this mystery of iniquity that recurs throughout history. But the Bible tells us something of the structure of evil behind the scenes. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6.12, a verse that we would do well to memorize and carry around with us, as it were, that human evil is egged on by invisible forces of evil. He says we aren't just wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I remember I was lecturing on this at a Lutheran church about 20 years ago, and there was an old woman in the back from Germany, and she raised her hand after I was done, Q&A, and she said, uh, and, and this was a lecture on Luther's view of the devil. Ironically, Luther, who was so hateful toward Jews in the latter half of his career, and incited so much anti-Jewish violence, and she raised her hand, and she was a Lutheran from Germany, and, and she was, I would say, in her 70s. She said, I remember when I was a little girl in Germany, in the 30s, and she said, we, we Germans did evil things. It was terrible, and I have no, ex I, I do not excuse what, what we did as a nation. It was evil, 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 but I must tell you, it was not just what we did. We were being driven by evil force. She said, I remember feeling it as a little girl. It was so thick in the air you could cut it with a knife. Mm -hmm. A force of evil. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, he says, it's not, you, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities 
and powers of the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul's statement, I think, helps us make some sense of what is finally irrational. Now think of it this way. If the true God is the true, is the true God of Israel, which I think all of us in this room agree, the true God is the God of Israel, and we know that he is, then it would make sense to the spiritual forces of evil to move human beings who usually don't realize that they're being so moved to attack the chosen people of the God of Israel. Evil hates the good. The forces of evil hate the source of good, the God of Israel. What better way, they presumably imagine, to destroy our nemesis, the God of Israel, than to attack the people this God chose to be the lights of the world. And what better way to attack them than to move Gentiles all over the world and all through history to hate them and try to exterminate them. This is one way, I would suggest, in which the mystery of Israel, Paul also refers to Israel as a mystery. In Romans 11, the mystery of Israel helps uncover the mystery of iniquity. These are evil days we're living in. And I fear that these are like the 1930s. I fear, I hope I'm wrong, but I fear there are many any similarities to the 1930s. But good days are coming. The same God who raised up Israel as a light to the nations. And Israel's Messiah, we believe, as the light of the world, is on his way to renew this world. It shall be glorious indeed. Israel will be at the center again as a blessing to all the nations and the peoples of that renewed world. May this conference be a reminder that just as Israel today attracts the hostility of so many, one day it will radiate the Messiah's light and love to all.